Well, welcome Boulder Mountain Community Church. Welcome to Baptism Weekend. My name is Kyle. If we've not met, we'd love to take a moment, maybe after service, introduce myself, answer any questions you might have about the church. So thank you for, for joining us. To those watching online, thanks for tuning in. And trust wherever you're at that you might sense the power and the presence of God in your life today. A little bit later in service, we will celebrate baptism, and that is a celebration according to Scripture. We're told that all of heaven celebrates anytime one person gives their life to Jesus. And so we're going to bring a little bit of heaven to this room here in Northeast Mesa. Deal? All right. I know sometimes we show up and we're ready to celebrate, and other times we have to make that intentional decision because maybe life has been really hard this week, and we have to make a decision to celebrate, and as we do that, God, God will honor that. We're wrapping up a series today called Taming the Tongue. A number of you are like, thank goodness. <laughs> this is finally over. So if you're a guest with us, we've been in the middle of a, a four-week series looking at the James chapter 3 called Taming the Tongue. And I've felt like God calling me to speak for a month on this topic, not just one week, because I don't know about you, I needed more than one sermon on this in my, in my life. So we're looking at James chapter 3. And before I read God's word, would you join me in prayer? Father, this morning we come to you thankful for all you've done. We're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for your provision in our life, beginning first and foremost with the redemption through your son. God, we, we're grateful that you can call us children because of what Jesus did. We're grateful for the lives that have been changed that we're going to celebrate later in service. I pray for those who are at home today because of illness because of sickness, because they're bedridden, whatever the reason is. God, I pray for those who received bad news this week, who are grieving the loss of maybe a job or a financial situation or the loss of a relationship. God, for those watching online, I pray that your power and presence would show up in a very powerful way, that they would have an undeniable sense that you are with them, even though they are not here physically, I pray, Jesus, that you would be with them spiritually. I pray for those in the room who may have heavy hearts. They may be prepared to celebrate or may not be prepared to celebrate. I pray you'll fill in the gaps. You'll give us exactly what we need today. And now as we come to your word, I pray nobody would hear from me, that they would hear from you, God, and we would respond accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 3, we're looking at the end of the passage, 13 through 18, and you're going to hear this text and be like, that's got nothing to do with taming the tongue. Oh, but wait. <laughs> Has everything to do with taming the tongue. Verse 13 of James 3, if you have a Bible, you can open up. If you do not own a Bible, we would love to give you one. You can take one on your way home, grab it. We want you to have a copy of God's Word or you can pull it up on your device here, James 3, 13. Good question, James asks. Who is wise and understanding among you? I think it's a rhetorical question. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, inspirational, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first. What a great list we're about to read. But wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to re reason, <clears throat> full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Earthly wisdom. What is earthly wisdom? It's the advice you and I get from 
outside the church, from people who do not follow Jesus or are not students of his word. There's a lot of that advice and wisdom out there. It's earthly wisdom. James is talking about two types of wisdom. The first is earthly wisdom. What is earthly wisdom? It's having this life only in view. It's every day you wake up, you only have yourself and this life in your perspective. That's earthly wisdom, worldly wisdom. What is heavenly wisdom or godly wisdom? It's the other type of wisdom. It's the ability to see life from God's perspective. Tony Evans says, wisdom is seen and understanding life from God's perspective and then making life's decisions based on that. Not making decisions based on what I want or what I think is best for me, but viewing it from God's perspective. If I were to preach a sermon about how to make an absolute mess of your life, right, let's reverse it today. How, how do you make an absolute mess of your life? Here's the answer. By listening and following worldly wisdom. It seems right in the moment. It seems right in your circumstance, in your situation. It may make sense to you when you first hear it, but it will lead to chaos and destruction. Worldly wisdom is this self-focused way of living that ultimately leads to chaos for me and others. Proverbs 14, 12 There's a way that seems right to a man. Some of us in the room can finish the rest of this. But in the end, it leads to destruction. Oh, when I heard it, that made a lot of sense. When I first received it, when my friend told me what I should do, that made a lot of sense. But here I am a year later, five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, and my life is so much more chaotic than when that was first given me. Worldly wisdom focuses on on me, what's best for me. How do I get ahead? How do I make myself look good? What do I do with my money that makes me feel better and gives me more comfort? Godly wisdom, in reverse, is a life characterized by placing Christ at the center, a Jesus-centered life where I ask myself, what does God want me to do based on this situation? What is God teaching me? What is godly wisdom, a life characterized with Christ at the center that leads to, as opposed to devastation and chaos, worldly wisdom, godly wisdom leads to fruitfulness in my life and everyone else around me. Godly wisdom will lead to fruit in your life, ultimately leads to righteousness, James says at the end. But also fruit, a life of fruit for others. Others will benefit from you following Jesus and taking biblical wisdom. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord. When, you, when you're faced with a decision to make, you have a lot of information. There's a lot of people telling you what to do and how to think and how you should behave. For every meme you look at, every time you scroll on social media, somebody's telling you how you should think and behave and act. It's worldly wisdom. What would it look like to have godly wisdom to say, God, what do you want in, in my life? And I'm going to make a decision, not a comfortable decision, not a decision that makes me even look good. I'm going to make a decision that's honoring and pleasing to you. Why? Because I have eternity in view. Worldly wisdom, you have this world in view, which will end one day. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a vapor. It's fleeting. Godly wisdom will last for eternity. And the decisions you make here will echo into eternity. There's a, there's a man in the Old Testament who had a dream And God came to him in the middle of the dream and said, ask for whatever you want. I'm giving you whatever you want. His name was Solomon. God comes to him in 1 Kings chapter 3. I can't break that all down because of time today, but read it this week. 1 Kings 3 and actually go into 4. It's a great story. In the dream, God says, I'll give you whatever you want. Let me ask you that question. If God came to you today today, you personally, and says, I'll give you whatever you ask for. 
rhetorical question. You don't need to shout it out. But in the stillness of your own heart, what would you ask for? God says, I'll give you whatever you want. What would you ask for? And so Solomon asks, he realizes the situation. His situation is one of he is overwhelmed. He feels like he doesn't have the information he needs to make the best decisions. He asks God, I want to know right from wrong. Give me, and this is what he asks for. He says, give me wisdom and the ability to know right from wrong. And God honors that. God gives him wisdom because he didn't ask for wealth and fame. All right? Other places in Scripture we're told, do not seek greatness. Because with greatness comes a very complicated life. Solomon asks for wisdom, and God gives him wisdom. And then chapter 4, there's a great example of him exhibiting his wisdom in, in leadership. But Solomon says, I am like a child. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I'm overwhelmed. Can anybody else relate? Like half the time, I don't even know what I'm doing. All right, confession of a pastor. But in order for Solomon to receive wisdom, what was required of him? When I was a youth pastor, the best stories will always begin when I was a youth pastor, as you get to know me. We, had, we took a camping trip. It was a canoe trip. We were camping, had high school boys. We had an activity to teach them what humility is and what humility looks like. So I had a little activity, tied a rope, big circle around a bunch of trees, and I blindfolded all the high school students, the leaders, blindfolded them all, place, place your hands on the rope. And the goal is to find the end of the rope. Now, they didn't know it was a circle. So they all have their hands on the rope, and I said over and over and over again, the goal is to find the end of the rope. Raise your hand if you need help. An hour later, they're still meandering around this circle, walking around trees or going different directions. And I said it till I was blue in the face. Raise your hand if you need help. Right. In order to receive wisdom from God requires the humility to say, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm acting like a child here. It's as if I have no idea what I'm doing. God, I need your wisdom. I need it. And I recognize it. I want your wisdom that only comes from you. Where do you get worldly wisdom from? Google. Right? <laughs> or years ago, Wikipedia. I'll admit, sometimes I, I like to share data and stats with my family, and I pull them out of the air sometimes. I'm like, I think 80% of the people do that. My wife's in data analytics, and she's like, I want to see the proof. I want to see the stats on that. You're making that up. One of, one of our daughters is very verbal. We've been talking about taming the tongue, and some of us average 6,000 words a day that we speak. I have one daughter who's probably running around the 30,000 mark. I don't know if you have that person in, in your family. She speaks a lot of words. And when, I was in, when she was in junior high, Wikipedia was kind of coming to popularity then. She's like, Dad, you're like Wikipedia. Half the stuff you say is true, and half of it's just made up, right? It's a confession from you. I, my wife calls me out on, on my stats and data all the time. But where do you find worldly wisdom? It's all around. Some of us listen to 24-7 news media. That's, their whole goal is to sell you fear and to make decisions based on what they think is going to happen, to cause you to tune in even more in the future. Oh, let's not get our wisdom from cable news. Where do you get wisdom from? Drama, complications in life comes from unwise decisions. And we could all be here for weeks if we all got up on stage and shared stories of decisions that we've made in life where we, we made the wrong decision. Wisdom creates a buffer between freedom and regret. Godly wisdom creates a buffer between freedom and regret. And Worldly wisdom will say, well, it's all about science, and it's all about facts, and it's getting your numbers right, and we're going to trust science on this. And then the other side says, no, it's about morality, and it's about what the church teaches about right and wrong, and right? it's, it's, not, it's not that. We find freedom in rules and laws. That's not very freeing. 
It's not, it's not this way either. So, so what is it? What is it? Jesus says that he is the mother of all wisdom. Some of us heard the story of Solomon I just shared in 1 Kings 3 and 4. And we're like, well, that'd be great. I would love to have that dream tonight. If God came to me tonight and said, well, I'll grant you whatever you ask for, whatever you wish. You already have a top five list in your notes today. You're like jotting those down. I, if this came true, then this came true. Let me tell you what Jesus says. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. These are, these are prayers you can say as you walk into a meeting that's created tension and stress for you all week long. Before that meeting, you can simply say the prayer, God, give me wisdom. Give me, I need help in this. I don't have all the answers. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you, John 15, 7. John 5, verse 14, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears it. He hears your prayer. But it begins with a humility of understanding that I don't have all the answers. I may, I may know some things, uh, the book of James that we're looking at here today is, is really the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's very practical advice. Uh, we called it a couple weeks ago, a blessed punch in the gut. When you read James, you want to be convicted, read James. All through, all through the book. In the Old Testament, there's the wisdom literature. See, every book of the Bible has a different genre of literature. You have narratives, you have poetry, you have prophecy. Today we're talking about wisdom. There's five books of the Bible that focus on wisdom. Proverbs, big one. In fact, you're saying today, I want to walk out of here, I want to be more wise in my life. Read a proverb a day. Today it's January 28th, so you would read Proverbs 28. Really good practice, helpful, takes a few minutes a day. You're going to Read a proverb a day. Now, the thing about proverbs, proverbs are not absolutes. They're general principles that if you follow them in your life, for the most part, good things will happen. But they are not absolute promises. Right? Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. That's, that's good. I can, I can introduce you to parents who did that, and their children have fallen away from the faith. All right? So they're not absolutes, they're general principles, that if you follow these principles in your life, it will be good. Ecclesiastes is another book of wisdom, but that's a book that comes to the conclusion all of life is meaningless and purposeless. So why do anything? Why don't you just lay in your bed all day, right? So you can't just focus on Ecclesiastes. You can't just focus on the book of Proverbs. It's a balance of scripture. We understand scripture in the light of the rest of scripture. Five books of wisdom, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, wisdom literature. You want to be wise? Spend time in God's Word. At the same time, God's Word was not written to you. It was not written to your specific situation. But yet it was written for you. It was written for me. So if I want to be wise, it it begins with knowing God's Word. But it also requires me to submit to the power and the work of the Holy Spirit who takes God's word and applies it to my situation. As I walk into a meeting, as you walk into a conversation, as you are on the phone call with somebody, God, give me the words to say, I don't know what to say here. Have you ever been in a situation like that? I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. God, give me the wisdom. Now, in James 3 here, Two types of wisdom results in two different things. Worldly wisdom results in a jealous heart. You make decisions and and choices that make you look good. As soon as you stop looking good, you're going to be jealous of the person because you can't celebrate a good thing in somebody else's life because that didn't happen to you. Worldly wisdom leads, right? Where does worldly wisdom come from? James says, from the enemy. It's demonic it leads to death. It leads to destruction. We're told that this Satan roars this world, roams this world, seeking to devour. 
Jesus comes that you might have life, life to the full, John 10.10 10 says, but the enemy comes that, to kill, right? When you listen to worldly advice, it will not end well for you. It will make your life more complicated. But the wisdom that James talks about that is heavenly, it leads to something. It leads to good deeds, not just for your benefit, but for the benefit of other people. Our women are going through a study on uh, the second half of the study of the book of Acts. I was reading this week, Acts 10.38 describes the ministry of Jesus. It's going through many verses. And then 10.38 says, and Jesus did many good deeds. Jesus is not just wise. He's the wisest person who's ever walked the face of the earth. I know I said Solomon earlier. Solomon, no one will be wiser than Solomon other than Jesus. Jesus, heads up, take, write this down. Jesus is smarter than you are. He knows more than you are, than, than you know. Not just to flex, so that we might experience the goodness that he has for us. Knowledge and understanding is not just for you. Right? Knowledge is not just so that you can be smarter. As we study God's word, we study God's word not just so I can know more. The goal of knowing scripture is to actually do scripture, not to just know scripture. You can study 24-7, study God's word, but that is not ultimately what God wants for you. He wants for you to understand God's word and then go and live out, live out God's word in, in your life. I want to walk, something, uh, walk this little uh, illustration here. It's in your notes if you are taking notes today. Uh, there's a passage in scripture talking about wisdom. How do I know what to do and when to do it? How do I have discernment in my life? There's a moment in time that we've all experienced. The Bible talks about time in a couple, couple different ways. One is chronos time, chronological time. It's a specific date and a specific time. And there are moments in our, our life where we can look at specific dates and specific times. But what we're talking about in Mark chapter 1, verse 14, and at the time, Jesus says... You read it. John was in prison, and there's a moment where we're going to talk about Kairos. Mark chapter 1. Kairos moment. Mark 1. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus was not talking about a specific day and time. He's talking about a kairos moment. We've all had kairos moments in our life that we can look back on. We say, God revealed himself to me in that moment. Maybe some of them are coming to your mind right now. There was a moment in my life where God showed himself. It's a kairos moment. The time has been fulfilled. The time is now. When that happens, there's a kairos moment, right? A lot of times we think of life in terms of chronology, God does not live in days and times like you and I do. He lives in an eternal now. If you can understand that, explain it to me. Everything happens at once with God. A kairos moment is when we stop. I'm driving home and I see the sunset. And I'm overwhelmed by God's power and his creation and his beauty. Now I can keep driving and ignore it. Or I can pull over alongside of the road. God, what are you saying to me? God, I'm, I'm so sorry. I've, I've been worried about all these things in my life when you're just, just revealing your beauty to me. I stop in this Kairos moment. I observe. I observe. I reflect or repent. Sometimes God gets my attention and I need to repent. God speaks to me and says, Kyle, what you said and how you said it was out of line. Right? Now, I can ignore that, which I've done, or I can submit to the power of the Holy Spirit and say, I'm going to sit with this. This is a Kairos moment in my life, and I need to own it. I observe it. God, thank you for pointing it out. I'm going to reflect. I'm going to repent, and I'm going to discuss this with someone else. When you look at the interactions with Jesus, the wisest, 
who was very wise. Through the Gospels, this is the pattern that you see. When people receive healing from Jesus, supernatural healing, they meet Jesus. There's a kairos moment. There's an interaction. They observe, they reflect, repent if needed, discuss. All of this, my friends, is wisdom. And this is the question, what is God saying? Begin there in the situations of your life, in the broken relationships of your life, in the big decisions that you, you got, that need to be made. Ask yourself, what is God saying to me? That's the wisdom side of it. But that's only half of it. God doesn't tell us things just so we can know things. This is really, really important. God doesn't reveal himself to you just for you and you alone. The second half is the courage. What is he asking me to do? If you can read this, probably not. First question, what is God saying? What's he asking me to do? Wisdom leads to something. In James 3, what does it lead to? Look at your text, James 3. What does godly wisdom lead to? Peace, gentleness, open to reason, full of mercy, good fruits, sincerity. It leads to something. If we're making wise decisions, others will benefit from that in our life. Our family will benefit from that. Our neighborhood will benefit from that. Good deeds, right? Wisdom. Now, me personally, most of the time I have this down. I know what God wants me to do. Challenge for me is the courage side. Maybe for you it's the opposite. You're a very brave person. You can do anything, but maybe it's the challenge is you don't know what God's asking you to do. And you're doing things before you know what God's asking you to do. It's both and. And so when we come over here, we come up with a plan. Hey, based on what God shared with me, this is the decision I need to meet. I'm going to meet with the guys in my men's group. I'm going to talk about it. And then I'm going to come up with a plan. Hey, I'm, I'm in financial debt. I'm going to cut up my credit cards as an example, okay? What's God asking you to do based on what he shared with you? And then I'm going to share it with the guys. There's going to be accountability. And then I'm going to act. All right, this is a circle. It's a kairos moment. Kairos moment. When God speaks, stop. Some of us are so busy, we, we don't even get this first step in. We blow right by it. And God was saying, putting a billboard up in the air saying, no, I, I, I want to meet with you. We're so busy. Like we find our value in how busy we are. How was your week? Really good. I was really, really super busy. Like somehow that makes you more valuable than the person who isn't busy. That's, that's not healthy. So may we have margin in our life where we stop. When, when God gets our attention, we stop and we reflect and we sit. And we ask, God, what are you saying? And now, now that I know what you're saying, I'm going to act on it. God doesn't just want you to be smarter. I want you to implement what you know. Live out God's word, not just know God's word. Knowledge does not lead to transformation. Right? Knowledge that's acted upon leads to transformation. There are those today getting baptized. They heard from God's word what their next step is. Right? And some of the conversations was, what do I do next? And I said, well, according to God's word, it's you get baptized. Okay, now there's courage to get up on stage in front of the whole church and get baptized. But here's what I know to be true. God doesn't ask any of us to do anything that Jesus did not do himself. Jesus modeled baptism for us as an example, right? Jesus goes with you, whatever he's asking you to do. It, it's hard. 
some of the things some of you are sharing, you know, what God's asked you to do, it's extremely difficult. It's hard. It takes a tremendous amount of courage. But we trust that what God has for us is good. Now, in, as I wrap up, this, this passage, we can walk out of here and say, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be wise, I'm going to be more peaceful, I'm going to be more gentle, and be more, right? And you can put your name in this passage sometime this week. You can, you can write your name. Is, is Kyle peaceful? Is Kyle gentle? Is Kyle open to reason? Is Kyle full of mercy? And maybe by 2 o'clock today, I, that'll last. God's not asking you to try harder and do better. But if I submit to the will of God in my life through the person of Jesus, if somehow Jesus supernaturally can indwell me through the power of the Holy Spirit, now I have hope. Now I'm not acting based on what Kyle wants. But God is living in and through me and in and through you as a follower of Jesus. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, today can be that day where you recognize that life as you've lived it on your own with yourself at the center has not panned out too well. Maybe you've recognized that in your own life. Your own life's just been full of complications. God does not want that for you. He wants peace. and He wants goodness for you. He wants you to make decisions based on the eternity, not just based on this, this side. Based on eternity. Today you have an opportunity to place your faith and trust in Christ who gave his life for you. The wisest person. He's not just, he's not just kind, he's wise, he's smart. And he loves you. No matter who you are, no matter the choices that you've made in your life, God has a, a plan, a future for you. I'm not saying it's easy but I'm saying it's good. As we trust God, it's good. God has good things for you. And today can be that day you place your faith. Maybe today is a, right now, in this moment, there's a Kairos moment happening. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Would you pray with me as we close? Father, for those in the room who have never placed their faith and trust in you, may they just simply say in their own words in the quietness and stillness of their heart, God, I recognize that I have placed myself at the center of my life. But today I recognize that I am a sinner in, needing, in need of repentance. I need to turn away from my sin and trust you. I recognize that you paid the price for my sins on the cross. And three days later you defeated death. And today you sit at the right hand of God preparing a place for us. And I choose to trust in you. Father, thank you that you tell us in your word that anytime someone places their faith in you, there's a party in heaven. And today we're going to celebrate that symbol of, of baptism. I pray for those getting baptized, that you would give them the courage, that you would be with them this week as they begin to live out their faith in a public arena. I pray that you would create a spirit of celebration in this room as you tell us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment when we recognize that God's been generous to us. So at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. 
If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do, and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.